Glory to God. And it's good to bring our praise to him. He's the reason for our praise. There's no one who deserves praise more than God. Hallelujah. We just have to take a look at his creation and see the splendor and glory of the work of his hands. All we got to do is look at this body that we're weary and consider the very, my God, unique form and means of how this body operates. And you will know how great our God is. Hallelujah. Just give you a scratch on the surface of how great he is. And when we compare it to the whole universe, hallelujah, that we see a greater picture of how great he is. Come on. And even all his creation cannot fully reveal his greatness. And that is how great our God is. Praise God. And we want persons to meditate on that today and think about the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The word of God said it is the goodness of God. The what? The goodness of God that leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God. And I believe persons need to embrace, believe, and respond accurately to the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Because God is good and everything that he does is good. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It says in glory to God. Romans 2. It's where we start. Praise God. Romans 2. It says, therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. Whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. In other words, that's why you condemn yourself because you are doing the same as the one you're condemning. He says, but we know that the judgment of God is according to truth. Against who? Against everybody? No, against those who practice such things. And he says, do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same is not just about judging them, but judging them and practicing the same. He says, you who judge those practicing such things and doing, not have done, but doing, that is in present continuous tense, the same, that you will escape the judgment of God Huh? He says, how do you despise the what? The riches of his goodness. Woo! Glory to God. Do you despise the riches of his goodness? Forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? To repentance. See, the goodness of God is not to accommodate sin or life and call it God's goodness. No, he says, this is what the goodness of God does. It leads you to repentance. And if you have not repented and you're telling others to repent, he says, do you think you will escape? You being one who has not repented yourself because you're telling others to repent? Come on. He says, don't you know? Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, his forbearance, and long-suffering, his patience, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to what? To repentance. Come on. He says, but in accordance with the hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Come on. Who will render to who? To each one according to his deeds. Come on somebody. Huh? Give me more. 
Hallelujah. So he says eternal life to who? To everybody? No, eternal life to those who by patient, continuous, continuance in what? By patient continuance in doing good. Come on, you can't continue to do evil and sin and say you're doing good. Those who by patient continuance in doing good for glory, honor and immortality. That's the prize that awaits them. For glory, honor and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, is the result the same? No. Come on. He says, those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, what is awaiting them? Indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil. Of the Jews first and also of the Greek. Come on now. But glory and honor and peace be to who? To everyone who works what is good. Hallelujah. To the Jews first and also to the Greek. Why? For there is no partiality. Woo! Come on somebody. There is what? There is no partiality with God. God wants you to know that his judgment is certain. Hallelujah. And the results are stated there already before that final judgment comes. What will be the result for those who continue to practice sin? And what will be the result for those who through patient continuance in doing good hallelujah that they'll receive glory honor and immortality but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness there is indignation and wrath huh? tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the jews first and also of the Greeks he says God doesn't care whether it's Jew or Gentile the bottom line is that he commands men everywhere to repent this is not a suggestion this is not a mere request it is a command and God intend to watch over his word hallelujah and to declare to you that you have a chance now to make it right with God you don't have to continue in sin. You don't have to serve the devil. You don't have to keep sinning and saying, we are sinners and all falling from grace. All fall short of the glory of God. Christ came to change that report. Hallelujah. That's how we were. Being descendants of Adam who sinned before he had us. And we came out as one with that same nature. To violate the word of God. But Christ is saying to correct that nature in us. To bring it into subjection to God. And bring us in fellowship with God. Through our obedience to him. It's not merely belief in him. Hallelujah. But through our obedience to him. As we followed then Adam who sinned. And we also sinned. Then he says, if we follow Christ, who live righteous, we will also be righteous. See, we are not just called to believe in him. We are called to follow him. He laid an example for us. And many do not th think about these things. They think, no, Christ came as an advocate every time I sin against the Lord, forgive me. And I'm good. But it is not so. He's not come to excuse you from sinning and getting away from the punishment. He's here to give you a new life. And that new life is in Christ. And there is no sin in him. Come on. And if you are in him, then you will not sin. And that's what he's saying. You must abide in him. You must what? 
Oh God. First John 3. Haha. Verse 4 to 6 says, Whoever commits sin also commits what? Lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to do what? To take away our sins. And he says, and in him, there it is. In him, there is no sin. And what does he say next? Since in him there is no sin, the following statement says, Whoever abides in him does not sin. Imagine that. Come on now. Most believers do not believe that. They will tell you we are abiding in him, but we still sin. Because we are human and we are sinners, but thank God for grace. They are forgetting this point in the gospel that grace is not given for you to continue in sin but given to bring an end to sin through the life of Christ in you if the spirit of Christ dwell in you his life will be demonstrated through you it won't be you trying not to do it of your mere self but his spirit in you keeping you from doing it come on that's why I said it's not of your own works that you should boast but by grace because he says grace is God's enabling power released to you through Christ to do what he calls you to do and Christ always does what the father declares he should do come on somebody huh? in Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 it says for by grace you have been saved through faith remember <laughs> What he says, you're saved by grace through what? You're saved by grace through faith. He says, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. The grace is the gift. But the grace does a work in you. Look at this. He says, not of works lest anyone should boast. In other words, it's not of your own works. What he says, look at what he says. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship created in who? Created in Christ Jesus for sin? No. Created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There is the works coming forth now. That shows you that the work, the faith by itself, believing by itself doesn't prove. Hallelujah. That you are truly saved. He says then it must produce the works of God. You were doing works before knowing Christ. And those were works of the flesh, sin. And that is what is spoken of also in Galatians 5. Hallelujah. Verse 19 to 21. He says these were the works of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are evident, he says, which are adultery fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. In other words, there's more to it but things like that. Because we notice even lying is not listed there. But he says anything like that. He said of which I tell you beforehand. I tell you what? Beforehand. As just as I also told you. In time past. So he says I told you before you received the gospel. And I told you after you since you have received several times. He said just as I have told you in times past. He says that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is no if and but. The message has not changed. The gospel hasn't changed to some accommodation of sin on behalf of our sinful state. Jesus died and we are excused. Remember what he says, you are inexcusable, oh man, that says this is wrong and still continue to do it. For he says, woe to the one that know it the right and do it, it not. Come on. So it says you need to know 
Here, oh, come on. You who said the word of God is true and still deny the word. You must know the judgment that follows. Those that deny the word, that they must also face the consequence of such actions. And it will bring death, separation from God and the life of God in Christ. And he's saying to you, it doesn't have to be that way. Remember the goodness of the Lord. That's what we're talking about today. Remember the word, the goodness of the Lord that he didn't have to give us another chance. He didn't have to show mercy towards us. He didn't have to make a way for us to be restored to him, to be reconciled to him. But he did it anyway. And he said he beard with much to do it. It cost him a lot. And he says, then since he has done that for us, what kind of life should we live? Should we continue to sin that grace may abound? Paul asks the question in Romans chapter 6, verse 1 to 11. He says there, should we continue because there is grace? No, he says, grace was not given for you to continue. That's why he says, certainly not. He says, how shall we who died to sin? Come on. This is what grace caused you to do. Die to sin. He says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Grace doesn't excuse you to sin. Grace gives you power over sin. Come on. That grace is in our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ, who, oh, though he was tempted in all ways, he did not sin. His life in you will give you a new testimony. You abiding in him will give you a new testimony. For he said, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. Is that we believe it or we don't? But we cannot say we believe it and then live contrary to what we believe and still believe our belief will save us. No, James is making it clear. Belief without corresponding action, what he calls works, is dead. And he says your belief mixed with your obedience is what makes your belief perfect. In other words, it yields the perfect result. The result that God is looking for must come by your response to his word in obedience. Come on now. He said in James 2, hallelujah, from verse 18 to 21, he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. But what did James say? Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works you believe there is one god and he says that's good you do well to believe that but he says even demons believe there's one god that don't stop them from being demons <laughs> he says even demons believe and tremble but he says but you want to know O oh foolish man that faith without works is dead was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Come on. He says Abraham didn't just believe. Abraham was obedient. Watch this. He says, do you see that faith was working together with his works? Faith was what? In other words, it's not his works alone that gave him that grace. But his works accompanied with the belief, the confidence in the word and integrity of God. He says, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. Look at that. Works makes faith perfect. In other words, it produced the result God is looking for. And that is produced through belief that accompanies our obedience to the word of God. And he says the scripture was fulfilled. See, even the word that was declared to him that he believed, 
it was fulfilled when he obeyed he says scripture was fulfilled which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God and even Jesus said you are my friends if you do whatever I command you that is still speaking about obedience so it says you see then that a man is justified he's declared righteous and in right standing with God by works and not by faith only come on it's not by faith only he says likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and send them out another way come on she hid them and kept them though she know her city would be destroyed because of these messengers that came from Israel but she sided with them over her own people and her own land that was faith it wasn't merely just believing that her city would be destroyed but her actions accompanied her belief so she said she seek for safety with them and they gave her a sign that she would hang a scarlet thread on her window hallelujah that when they come to that house they would know that she was one that sided with them and showed them favor so favor would be shown to her when destruction would come to that city and so it was and she was added to the list of people hallelujah the chronicles of faith the accounts of faith as those who stood by and obeyed the word of God hallelujah he says just then he says like Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way for as the body without the spirit he says as the body without the spirit is dead so faith without works is dead also hallelujah he says the body doesn't have any life without the spirit is the spirit that gives life to the body and when the spirit leaves that body you say give up the ghost when that spirit leaves that body that body is dead he says just the same way your works is the life of your faith it's not your belief it's your your belief is not the life of your belief it's your works it's the life <laughs> of your belief it's what shows that your belief is not merely just a belief but it's now a way of life for you and that's what God wants to see manifest in you and through you as you embrace his word that's the goodness of God God knows that his word always deliver what pleases him he said that in Isaiah 55 verse 10 and 11 God knows that his word always delivers what pleases him and that's why he knows that if we are connected to his word hallelujah and abide in his word we will always please him come on and sin does not please him come on now in Isaiah 55 verse 10 to 11 it says for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater he says so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void Come on, it will not return empty and accomplish or unfulfilled in a mission for which it was sent. He said, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please. There it is. And it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it to do. In other words, his word will not fail. Come on, somebody. And he said that if you abide in the word, you will get the same result. That's why the Lord wants you to be yoked together with him. Come on. He says, cast all your cares upon me and learn from me. He doesn't say learn of me, but he says, learn from me. 
There's some things he wants to teach you that will assure the result that the father is after. And he said that in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30. He says, come to me. He didn't say come to the day. These people already had a day of rest. A day of worship. But he says, it's not the day you're called to. You're called to the Lord of that day. And he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, it's not the day that give you rest. He says, I who give you rest. Unfortunately, they never got that. They still saw him as a break of the Sabbath and wanted to kill him for it. But he was already telling them, I will give you rest. Come on now. He so he says, take my yoke upon you. In other words, be yoked together with him. And he says, what will be the result of that? Learn from me. Learn. Come on. Learn how to walk as I walk. Learn how to talk as I talk. Learn how to operate as I do. And he says, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find what? There it is. You will find rest for your soul. Hallelujah. You will what? Find rest for your soul. There's no rest for your soul in sin. No matter how much headstone you put on that grave, rest in peace. They are not resting in peace in sin. There's no peace in sin. The prince of peace, the ruler of peace, Christ himself has come to give you that peace. And that peace is in him. And in him, there is no sin. And he says, those who abide in him do not sin. Don't you see the result is certain in him? He says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Unfortunately, most believers say it's hard to serve the Lord. Hard to serve him. Now, I don't hear anyone, one of them going around say it's hard to serve sin. Yet still it leads to destruction, condemnation, and being disqualified from the kingdom of God. But they don't say it's hard to serve sin. But they say it's hard to serve Jesus. That's why you know that they are considering more about the flesh than about the spirit. Those who are mindful of the flesh are pleased to do what pleases the flesh. Anything that works against what the flesh wants. They say it's hard because they are carnally minded. And Paul says to be carnally minded is death. Why? Because he says that mindset is hostile towards God and is also hostile towards God's word. Come on. And he says that mindset of being carnal minded cannot please God. Come on. That's Romans 8 verse 5 to 8. He says those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, what do they set their minds on? The things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded whoa, is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity. It's hostile against God. Come on. For it is not subject to the law of God. In other words, it doesn't want to submit to what God's word commands. Nor indeed can be. So then those, he says, who are in the flesh, who are mindful of the flesh, is what he's calling in the flesh. He says, cannot please God. What it says next, he says, but you are not in the flesh. He's talking to the believers who are in Christ. He says, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And what's the condition? Anywhere you see the word, if, there's a requirement, there's a condition. He says, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. He says, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he's not his. It's the spirit of Christ in you giving you life. 
Without the spirit of Christ, you don't have that life. He says, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But what that spirit is doing? The spirit is life because of what? Righteousness. Come on now. He says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life. Come on. Give life to what? Your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Is this that life will be given to you in this body, this mortal body? Not when we all get to heaven and get a glorified body. He says that life will be given to you in this mortal body. Why? Because that spirit dwells in you now. So it is sure that many who say it dwells in them, it is not true. Because their life does not testify that. Their life has a contrary result. And the word of God is certain about the result. The word of God doesn't say maybe you will, maybe you won't. Maybe you'll make it, maybe you won't. No, the word of God is certain. It is declaring that those who obey the truth will receive glory, honor, and immortality. But those who disobey the truth, he said clearly what they will also receive. Huh? Wrath and indignation, huh? tribulation and anguish on every soul. There's no discrimination on every soul of man who does evil of the Jews first and also of the Greeks that's what he said hallelujah in Romans 2 verse 7 and 8 showing you that their verses to, to back up and to bear evidence to that statement that we don't we are not guessing what will be the result when we do or when we don't we know the result and in knowing the result if you want the result for life you must do what is required to gain it and not try to excuse yourself away and say God is good and God is great. Huh? Let us excuse ourselves away because the Lord is so merciful. He's so kind. He knows we are just sinners. No. He said it is the goodness of the Lord that leads men. Oh, glory to God. To repentance. Come on. God shows his love to sinful men, not for them to remain sinful, but that they may show his demonstration of love, receive that love, and also return that love to him in obedience. But he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That is how he says, you're going to show your love. It's more than just a feeling. Huh? That you get when you get the feeling and say oh i love the lord i just feel goosebumps i feel like i'm flying in the cloud hallelujah thank you jesus and you're still living in sin no 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 the lord says that love resolves every fear it's fear that keeps you in sin those who believe in the lord knows that when the spirit of god is given he extinguishes expel fear from your life Come on. He said you have not given a spirit of fear. But you have been given a spirit of love. And power. And sound mind. That's the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Come on. He says the Holy Spirit doesn't come to make you timid. And fearful and weak. And flawed before the enemy. He comes to give you the tenacity. The boldness. The awareness. The full position in Christ. And in Christ you are more than conquerors. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Therefore the one who is less of great, who, less greater, who should they say, who is not as great, should not rule over the one who is greater. And if he who is greater is in you, then you should not become a prey to the one who is less in greatness. Come on. He says that's what John said in 1 John 4. Yes, verse 4 to 6. He says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. That's those who have the world. Why? Because he who is in you 
is greater than he who is in the world. They are of the world, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. Come on. You notice when believers come out telling the world that they're sinners just like them, the world love them. Because the world says, oh, that tells you and tell others that you're just like us. And how does that distinguish you from them? If you are the same as them, why are you saved? And they are not. When there is no partiality with God. Come on, you need to let it be clear to them that you repented. You turn from darkness to light. You turn from sin. To the righteousness of God. You turn from the power of Satan to God. You turn from fear to faith. You turn from disobedience to obey the word of God. That is what made you different. So you cannot say we are all the same. That would make God be partial to save some sinners and condemn the rest. Come on. You are not giving God a good report by saying that. You may gain a lot of friends and a lot of followers and they might love you and applaud you and say you're one of the good ones. But at the end of the day, you're losing your friendship with God. Come on now. He says there, they are of the world. Therefore what? They speak as of the world and the world hears them. We are of God. He who knows God. There it is. He who knows God hears us. Come on. He who is not of God does not hear us. This is a clear truth that John declares here and says, this is how we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Those who are speaking to get friendship with the world and get the applause and welcome from the world are not seeking the glory of God. They are seeking friendship with the world. And the word of God says friendship with the world is enmity with God. Huh? In James 4, hallelujah. In James 4, verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Consider that. But many of you have become great friends with them. Really been enticed to say that even Jesus is a friend of sinners. And that is not true. Jesus was accused, falsely accused of being a friend of sinners. Make that clear that it was not something that Jesus said he was, but something that others said he was, which was clarified in the scripture. Come on, look in Matthew chapter 9. Let's look at that. In Matthew chapter 9, reading from verse 9, this was where it was found, where it says, Jesus passed on from there, saw a man named Matthew, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. What did he say? Yeah, he's not saying, friend me. <laughs> he's not saying, friend me. He's not friend, he's looking for Matthew at the tax office. He says, follow me. That's how his disciples became his disciples. They have to follow him. Know that. He says, follow me. So he arose and what? Followed him. He left that, minute, that business to follow Christ. He says, no, it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house. That behold, many tax collectors. In other words, Matthew being a tax collector, now being a disciple of Jesus, is sitting with Jesus' disciples to eat. But other tax collectors come to check out who he left the job to sit with. Look at that. Many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him. With him who? With Jesus and his disciples. Notice, Jesus' disciples are not called the tax collector and sinners. 
sinners came and sat down with Jesus and his disciples. Mark that. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, Why do your teacher, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Even the Pharisees did refer to Jesus' disciples as sinners. Note that, but he says, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. Not speaking that Jesus' disciples was, but asking the disciples, why are your master eating with them? They never asked the disciple, why are your master eating with you? They asked him, why are you eating with them? Because they want to disqualify the master before his students. And he says, Jesus heard that, and he said to them, those who are well look at this those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are what sick come on now sick people don't go to the doctor to look friend they go to the doctor to get treatment for their ill condition so he said the office is not set up for friendship the office is set up for service to people who are in ailment of sick and disease. So he says, think about that when Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, he's calling those who came as sinners and tax collectors sick. Mark that. And you don't go around calling your friends sick. You don't go friending people to call them sick and you will be the physician no he says but go and learn he says what this means i desire what i desire mercy and not sacrifice what for i did not come to call the righteous look at this now but sinners to repentance come on if he says call sinners to repentance will the sinner still be sinner no it's not once a thief always a thief the repentance is to turn from that lifestyle therefore they will not be sinners anymore you see they would now be his disciples and that's what many miss and now saying jesus is friend of sinners hmm they have missed it. That's not the point Jesus is making at all. Jesus never said any such thing. Come on. You need to understand that. That Christ is calling you to newness of life in him. In him you got that life. Apart from him, you don't have it. Come on. John stated the same. John stated the same in 1 John 5, verse 9 to 13. He says, if we believe the testimony or the report of men, he says, the report or testimony of God is greater. He says, for this is the witness of God which he what? He testified. This is testimony. He has testified of his son. He has what? Testified of his son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness. Come on. In himself. In other words, he have that testimony. Come on. He says, he who does not believe God has made him a liar. Does that one have that testimony? Does he have that witness in himself? No. He does not believe the testimony God has given. He says, because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. God gave a testimony of his son. And he says, what is that testimony? Verse 11. This is the testimony that God has given us. There it is. Eternal life. And this life is where? It's in his son. Come on, we tell you already. Those who abide in him have that life. And those who abide in him does not sin. Oh, come on, he says, he who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. 
it is clear here he's not calling that life an extension of mortal life otherwise he would say you have the life but you don't have it to the full but he said you don't have it at all because he's speaking about a different life in Christ come on and he says apart from him you cannot have it that life is in Christ come on he says these things I have written to you come on now who believe in the name of the son of God he said if you believe in the name what does that name tell you call him Jesus for he will take, save his people from their sin not with their sin that's what that name is saying do you believe in that name that he saved you from your sin or do you believe he saved you with your sin come on now many believe the latter which shows that they don't really believe in that name Matthew 1 verse 21 tells you that he was called Jesus he says for he will save his people from their sin not with their sin from it there has to be a total detachment there's no connection with you and sin in Christ come on he says that's so he says those who believe in his name he says he said I want you to know that you have that you what you have eternal life in other words that life is in you why because that life is in the son come on now that's why he said if any man have not the spirit of Christ he's none of his they don't have that life in them they don't have that inner witness he says but that you may continue to believe in the name of the son of God come on I want you to get it huh? you hear me quoting a lot of scriptures because I want to ensure you don't just hear me saying and not hear scripture saying come on because I want you to hear what the word is saying come on and he pull a lot of scriptures together to show you that it is in sync with the message of the kingdom hallelujah that God must take rulership in your heart first it's not an external rulership that you're trying to meet your heart must be in it otherwise your worship and your efforts will be in vain his spirit must dwell in you and you must abide in him and he said if you do such you will bear fruit much fruit and fruit that remains come on it will not be there temporarily but then sometime it gone sometime you got love sometime you got hate sometime you're faithful sometime you're not sometime you're humble but sometime you're proud like the devil himself no he says that kind of wavering shows you are not stable in him that's what he calls the double-minded man hallelujah that is spoken of in James 1 hallelujah verse 5 to 7 he said if any of your lacks wisdom <laughs> verse 5 to 8 he said if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of God if you want to be wise and Jesus says those who are wise are those who obey his sayings they hear them and they do them the ones who hear them and don't do them he says they're like the foolish man that built his house on the sand he will lose his position and his possession he will lose it all but the one who hears and obeys he says he's likened to a wise man that built his house on the rock it was safe after all the tests the storm and the waves and the wind beat on that house it stood firm because of its solid foundation huh here james is saying in james 1 verse 5 if any of you lacks wisdom if you lack wisdom in this era he says let him ask of god god will give you that wisdom liberally and without reproach 
Come on, somebody. You know sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It's not wise being in sin or committing sin. Come on. But he said, if you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all what? Liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But there's a condition. He said, but let him ask in faith without doubting. What's that doubting about? That doubting is maybe he'll do it, maybe he won't. Maybe he'll serve the Lord, maybe he won't. That doubting, he says, will not produce the result. Look at that. Let him ask in faith without doubting. Why? For he who doubts is unstable. He said it's like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind, up, down, all around. He says, for let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Come on, you know you hear the word speaking to you. It's bigger than me. It's the word. Come on. He says, he who comes to the Lord like that, he says, he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. The word of God doesn't make you unstable. It makes you stable in all your ways. So I speak of that man who hears the word and does the word. Jesus says, I will liken him to a wise man that built his house on the rock. That man's house was not unstable because he hear and obey. But the one who heard and did not obey he was likened to a foolish man that built his house on the sun. And surely enough, his house was not stable. When the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. It fell, and great was its fall. He lost everything. Come on. The Lord is telling you, there is no great reward in his obedience. Your great reward is in obeying the Lord. You cannot just believe in the Lord and think just because you believe in him, you will be saved. There is call for corresponding actions. Come on. And some will say, what about the thief on the cross? What did he do? Well, let's examine that thief on the cross. Do you realize that that thief on the cross was testifying of his faith in the Lord before an unbelieving crowd. They were not believing crowd. They are witnessing to him to give his life to the Lord. They were actually saying things that were making it seem like Jesus was a counterfeit, was an imposter. He was being viewed as an imposter place between two thieves to suffer and bled and die like a criminal and yet still that thief was saying we deserve what we got in defense of Jesus but this man has done nothing to deserve this come on somebody huh look what that man said in Luke 23 Verse 39, he says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. He says, If you are, this is what you must do. Like what the devil said to Jesus, If you are the Son of God, turn the stone, the stone to bread. Come on now. See, the devil was speaking to him. But the other answering rebuked him what did the other do there was corresponding action to his faith he rebuked him saying do you not even fear God come on somebody 
seeing you are under the same condemnation and we indeed justly in other words we deserve it for we receive the due reward of our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong come on somebody and I know that those Jews and high priest was not appreciating him saying that in their midst that they had accused and sentenced an innocent man. This was the environment this thief was speaking in when he said to the Lord, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He didn't say, if you come into your kingdom. This man is fully persuaded. He is the Christ. And though he knows he's going to die, he says, when you come, not if, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Come on, somebody. You want to tell me that's not faith with corresponding actions? Come on. And Jesus said to him, as surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Oh, glory to God. Come on. Faith without works is dead. Come on. That man testified in an hostile environment. People weren't there applauding him and said, Yay, congratulations, you accept the Lord as your Savior. Ah, like many of them want to use it as a deathbed repentance. Oh, yes, I'm ready to die now. May the Lord have mercy on my soul. Save me from my sins so I go to heaven. You're going to hell. You have no true testimony in the Lord. You are just trying to escape death. This man wasn't trying to escape death. Come on now. This man was saying, certainly, I know this man is the Christ, the son of the living God. And we deserve this, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he says, please remember me when you come into your kingdom. Whoa, glory to God. And that man demonstrated true faith. And Jesus accepted him. Will that be the testimony for you? Or are you just hoping that on the mercy of God, you'll be saved? And I'm telling you, it's not so. He didn't say you're saved by mercy. He says by grace. And Paul made it clear that grace is not given for you to continue in sin. He says you must end that life. He said if you are dead to sin, how can you continue in it? Christ came to make you dead to sin. But alive to God in Christ. Now you're not slaves of sin anymore. But he says being fled free from sin, now you become slaves of God. Partakers of his holiness and righteousness. Come on somebody. Huh? And that's in Romans 6 verse 20 to 23. He says for when you were slaves of sin you were free in regard to to righteousness he says when you were pastors when you were slaves of sin Paul said to the believers there, when you were slaves of sin you were free in regard to righteousness you you had no nothing to compel you to do what is right come on that's what he's saying to them but what fruit did you have then what was the result of that life he says of things of which you are now ashamed. Come on. For the end of those things is what? Death. It just leads to separation from the life of God in Christ which is eternal life. But he says but now having been set free. This is the present position in the Lord. He says but now having been set free from sin. It's not with sin, from sin. And having become slaves of God. Who you're serving now, sin? No, you're serving God now. He says, now having become slaves of God. What's the result of that now? 
you have your fruit to holiness. And what's the end result? Everlasting life. That's eternal life. Come on. Why? Because say, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in who? In Christ Jesus our oh, Lord. You don't have that life outside of him. And you can't be in him sinning. Come on, he already made that clear. That life is in him. Now many people are in Christianity. The religion and sin. That is true. But no one remains in Christ and sin. That is true. Right, so the word of God makes it clear to you. It's not religion that saves you. It is Christ who saves you from sin. Come on. The Jews had religion, but they rejected Christ. And we want you to understand this is not about religion. This is about Christ. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Word of God become flesh, the Word of life, that eternal life that was with the Father, that was manifested to us. That's the life John said, we preach to you that you may have fellowship with us and truly your fellowship of fellowship is with God and his son, Jesus Christ. Come on. Hallelujah. So he says he wants you to know that life. Glory to God. And those who walk in that life, he says they walk in newness of life. It's not the old life being renovated or enhanced. It's a new life deposited in them through Christ, the living word, and the Holy Spirit of God indwelling in their being. For he says, I will pour my spirit on them and I'll put my spirit within them. I'll take out the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And I will call them my people. And I will be their God. Hallelujah. And he said, I'll put my spirit in them that they will do those things that pleases me. Come on now. God wants you to do it. And you cannot do this by religion. Religion puts people in a position to seek to please God through self-effort. You hear that? Religion puts people in a position to please God through self-effort but salvation moves it from self-effort to faith in the finished work the active word of God and his spirit operating in the believer's life in other words he's not relying on his flesh he's relying on the spirit that indwells him to live that life and that spirit came with that life. That's why I say you must believe on him. Come on now. Huh? Come on now. From knowledge to true revelation. It is a conveying. A migration. A what? A migration. It is in that conveying. That we who are believers. Are no longer in our old position. Operating under the influence of the sinful nature with its lusts and dictates. One cannot be mindful of the old life while being in the new life. It takes away from the influence and the power and the fullness of what is in the new while still meditating and mesmerizing on the old. It's like a woman was married to one man and that man died and now she's married to another but she's still mesmerized about the old marriage she had and now talking to Tom about when she was with George come on it violates the marriage and the Lord said it even Paul declared it that he had to become dead to the law that effort of trying to please God's word through the flesh had him under the law but under grace, he says, I'm not under the law. For there's a new life now in him. Empowering him to live the life 
that fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. Come on. When transformation takes place, the one being transformed walks differently, talks differently, lives differently. There is a different nature in them. Come on. The nature of Christ. Often the devil wants the believer to think that they have not truly been changed. To think that they are still the same. That they are still living the old life. That believer must be mindful of the change that has taken place in them. Because of who is now living in them. Christ. Come on. If they are not mindful of it. The devil will take a set on them and even bring them back to that old life and they'll be condemned for it. Paul encourages and commands the believer to take notice of the change God made in their lives. Come on. That's why he said in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 Therefore if anyone he don't care what that person is What's their position, title, officer, how long they've been around in the church? He said, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. All things have passed away. And behold, that is to take notice, all things have become new. Come on. Many believers have been changed. They have become new. But they are not mindful of that newness. They do not take notice of it. Come on. The enemy of their faith will always challenge the truth. If the believer is not taking notice, they can miss some vital points. Come on. We are called to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Come on. Romans 12 verse 1 and 2. He says therefore. I beseech you therefore brethren. By the mercy of God that you present your bodies. A living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable unto God. Come on it can't be holy in sin. He says holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service and don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you'll prove that good acceptable perfect will of God come on huh he says we are not of the world although we still live in the world the new birth causes us to operate differently from the people of the world and the system of this world. Come on. Come on somebody. So Romans 6 verse 4 says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should walk in what? Newness of life come on being first born in the flesh we were confined and defined by those who are in the flesh but now being born of God we are confined and defined by the word of God as children of God through his Holy Spirit and we must continue to embrace obedience to the word and submission to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in our lives to remain as children of the Most High God. God defines us as being in the Spirit, His children. He's not calling us children as being in the flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, but it's in the Spirit. So he said, if you abide in him and his spirit abide in you, 
Won't we see that life in you? Come on, somebody. This is a higher realm of operation. New culture, new values, eternal riches and wealth, a new family, a whole new life in Christ. Come on. One image is found, our image is found in God, and our likeness is found in Him. You will not find this in any other creature. It is only found in the source, God the Father, our Creator. We began with Him, and we are complete in Him. The opposite is also true. Hallelujah. So we began with him and we are incomplete without him. Come on. Huh? We got to abide in him. And that's what he says. If you remember the goodness of the Lord. David said, I would have fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Come on. When you think on the goodness of the Lord, you must, it must build some loyalty and faithfulness in you towards him, knowing the sacrifice that he paid for you. This sacrifice that you're giving to him is the least you can do. That's why it says presenting your body as a sacrifice is just reasonable service. It's the least. It's not a call to above and beyond the call of duty. That's just reasonable service. Because what you are giving as your all, God's all is way more than that. And if you receive, give your all, he will pour on you his all. And that's way more than enough for you to commit Come into good success and gain continual victory in Christ Jesus. Come on, somebody. Bow your heads with me. We're going to pray. We believe that God has declared a word to you to remember that the goodness of the Lord leads to repentance. And it is godly sorrow that leads to repentance that brings salvation. Those who have godly sorrow will not continue in sin. They know the heartbreak. They, they know the defilement, the, the hurt that they suffer every time they engage in sin. And they refuse to continue to live in that way. They would rather have Jesus. And he living in them gives them the power over sin and reconciles them to God the Father. To have true life with him. And walking in true fellowship with him. Because in him. There is no darkness. At all. Father in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity. That you have given to us. To change from our evil ways. To humble ourselves. And pray and turn. From our wicked ways. That turning is necessary for salvation. If we continue to do the same, then you said, let not that man think he'll receive anything from the Lord because he's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. But those who have made up their mind have to give their all to you. You said, if we seek you with all our hearts, diligently, we will find you. And that salvation and light and life will be unveiled in us. Right now, let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Remove every thought, imagination, reasoning, feelings, and views that oppose the authenticity of your word. We bring them into captivity, every thought, and imagination it exalts itself against your word and knowledge of you and so we pray that grace 
we be released as we humble ourselves, submit to you and resist the devil. He will flee from us and will gain life eternal in Christ Jesus. We thank you for it now, Lord. We claim the victory and give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, give God the praise. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Glory to God. I'm so glad I got salvation in time. That salvation is in Christ. I was around religion for a long time. But Christ brought me into true salvation. That religion was short and doing. Always making promises and making requirements that cannot be fulfilled. But in Christ it is fulfilled. And I'm telling you, abide in him and let his word abide in you. Because he already told his disciples, apart from me you can do nothing. Come on. But with him, <laughs> it has a whole new result. And we're encouraging you to make that with a stable part of your life. Hallelujah. Because there's no with him in sin. But there's with him in righteousness, in holiness, in truth, in the light and life of God operating in us. And I'm praying your strength that you will not just say this with your lips, but that God will do a work on your heart. That the things that once used to hold you down, you'll gain power over it in Christ. And rise up as a new creation in him. Ready and equipped and ready. To do all good works that is prepared for you to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. If you heard the word today. And the word touched your heart. Don't ignore it or try to play it off by flooding your mind with other things. That will make the word be of no effect to you. But mix the word with faith that the word will be profitable to you because those who hear the word and don't mix it with faith it's unprofitable to them but we encourage you to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might and I'm praying your strength in Jesus name I know God wants to bring you into a whole new level of living and experiencing his presence and power in your life you don't have to keep dreaming, fantasizing about it, or just talking about it. It's there for you in Christ Jesus. And I'm telling you, make every effort, hallelujah, to embrace his anointing and see that life manifest in you. Come on, believe in him that that power is available to you now to do so. Not of your own self, but in him to empower you to do so. Glory to God. And we are praying that strength be manifested in you. In Jesus' name. Now those who want to hear more of the teachings, we have a book we release on Amazon.com. We read even a portion of it today in, in, in collaboration. Hallelujah. With the word we declare today. Remembering the goodness of the Lord. Hallelujah. The goodness of the Lord leads to repentance. Hallelujah. And so we want you to know that is something that God is not going to be mincing on like maybe or maybe not. No, God is quite clear in his rule on that and regulation on that and saying you must comply with the word. The word is not going to be altered for you. You must make every adjustment. Hallelujah. To comply with the word of God. Otherwise you'll be left out of the equation. Hallelujah. And we don't want that for you. So we encourage you to be strong in him. Praise God. Go on Amazon.com. Type in the search box. Richard V. Figa. And the book will come up. It's called the gospel of the kingdom. Subtitled the gospel that Jesus preached. It's a life gospel that is bringing life. Hallelujah. New life. To all who receive and believe in him. And he said they will not perish. If they truly believe in him. And continue. 
in that path to do what is confirming that belief that it is true. Come on. And so we encourage you to do so today. Praise God. So you can go on Amazon.com, type in the search box. We should be big and the book will come up. Can order the book anywhere around the world. Those who are close in our vicinity can order it from us. We have hardcover copies here still for those who desire to have it to enhance their faith in the Lord. And we really want you to know that faith in Jesus Christ produces the true life of God in Christ. Hallelujah. And we want you to embrace that today and see that manifesting in your life. Amen. Praise God. So you want to get more of the teachings, send a friend's request to Richard B. Fagan on Facebook. He'll be plugged into our five live stream teachings on Facebook each week. This is one of them. And also, we also edited it and put more scripture to it on our YouTube channel. Look for Apostle Richard Fagan and subscribe. I'm sure you'll find more resources of scriptures there that will show you that we are making your faith based fully upon this, the word of God and not merely on things you have heard us say, but know that scripture actually says what we have said. Hallelujah. Know that it is true. And that's how we declare the word here. Praise God. We encourage you to new heights in the Lord and new depths in his anointing and presence. Praise God. Hallelujah. Want to know more about our church? Check out our website. It's increasingfaithintl.org. That's our church's website. Increasingfaithintl.org. Those who have been blessed by the ministry can continue to sow to the ministry. Those who have not and are thinking about it until it's fertile ground to sow in. All the information is there on the website how to do so. We also have some long-term and short-term projects that we're aiming to accomplish. Your assistance and standing with us as covenant partners. Hallelujah. Our seed sowers will truly enhance and push us to do greater works for the Lord across the world as we move with this word of faith to transform the lives of people. Hallelujah. In the true life in Christ Jesus. Amen. Praise God for the word of God has the power to do so and that's what it's doing even now amen praise god so those who've been following up the ministry of a love gift for you whether you've spent or sent any love gift to us or not we have a love gift for you that's free it's called daily devotional those are teachings we have had during the days in the house that are not live streamed but we have scripted it and put it in a ebook form day-to-day -day teachings each month edition shows that will truly have your day-to-day -day learning in the word of the kingdom and building your faith along with others that choose to hear you and i believe it's a powerful tool for you whether you're in sunday school sabbath school or whatever sessions you're doing at your home home group study or a study with family or friends or co-workers you can always bring that word to them readily available to you with scriptural evidence to back it up that will help them to gain insight into the word of god the word of the kingdom amen it will truly transform their life and we are giving that to really push the body of christ to another level we're not holding back what we are putting out here we believe it's very useful and i believe it will really add to your faith in gaining greater stability and greater and fruitful results in the lord amen Praise God. Hallelujah. We're blessed today. Oh my God. I'm truly blessed to share the word with you today. Praise God. So if you want to get the daily devotional or make any contact with us, the number is on the screen. You can send it to you by WhatsApp or any further contact can be made to the number. It's 879-876-893-9390. Praise God. And 876-55724. 27-876-525-6757. Looking forward to hear from you. To be your most holy feet in the Lord. The information is all on the screen. And we are praying your strength in Jesus' name. So until next time, be strong in the Lord. And in the power of his might. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. And be gracious unto you. May the Lord never his countenance upon you. And give you his peace. God bless you real good in the Lord. 
Have a great day. In Jesus' name. Amen.